good evening and welcome to all the audience. So today we have a case of uh, polytrauma from uh, the Central ICU of St. John's uh, Medical College, Bangalore. And, uh, you know, St. John's Medical College is a premier institute and it's a wonderful case presentation and I hope it will be good learning from all of you. So polytrauma is uh, very common, you know, and most of the ICUs have to deal with polytrauma unless you're dealing exclusively with medical uh, patients. So uh, we thank Dr. Moses Charles D'Souza at the outset. Sir is professor and head of uh, surgical ICU at St. John's Medical College, Bangalore, who has enabled this uh, presentation and he'll be moderating this. Joining us along with him will be Dr. Francis Joseph. Sir is associate professor at the ICU and the case will be presented by Dr. Sis Jos. She is a fellow in the ICU in uh, surgical critical care. So over to you, uh, Dr. Sis Jos. Uh, good evening. Today's our uh, case is polytrauma. Uh, so, patient is a 57 year old female. She's a homemaker, hailing from Madiwala, Bangalore. To the history, uh, it is an alleged history of motor vehicle accident, which happened on 26th of se September 2023. And the mechanism is uh, pedestrian versus uh, four wheeler. Patient was walking on the footpath while uh, she got hit by a speeding car. She was found at the accident site by the passers by and an ambulance was called for. She was uh, uh, fitted with cervical collar, shifted on spine board to, in, uh, inside the ambulance. And inside the ambulance, patient was speaking, but she was unable to complete a uh, sentence. She was maintaining 90% with a uh, 10 liter per minute O2 uh, uh, of a face mask. Her BP was in the range of uh, 170. Her, uh, her pulse rate was 110 per minute, respirate rate of 30 per minute, and her score was, GCS score was E4, V5, M6. Now, patient was brought to St. John's Emergency Department 30 minutes after RTA. That time, her BP was, had dropped to 90-60. Pulse rate of 120, respirate rate 32, GCS of 14, uh, she was drowsy but arousable. Saturation was 90% with uh, 15 liters of O2. Uh, one minute, Dr. Sisjus. So, Dr. Yes. Francis and Dr. Moses, sir, your audio is enabled. You have to enable your audio. Yes. Dr. Francis, enable your audio. Yeah, okay. Yes. And, and uh, Swastik, doctor, please uh, disable your video. <clears throat> Okay, carry on, Dr. Sisjos. So, uh, in, inside the EMET, primary survey ABCD is done. So, first, patient was continued on O2 mask. She had no pooling of secretions. Airway was patent. But uh, on further examination, she, uh, there was distended neck veins uh, on um, on uh, removing the C, uh, C collar and seeing. So, uh, on auscultation, air entry was decreased bilaterally. Right, uh, right side, uh, there was a more increase. And there was more decrease in the air entry. The ultrasound lung was done. Uh, it showed absent lung sliding on the right side. ICD was placed on an emergency basis. Almost 150 to 200 ml of uh, blood was drained out. Meanwhile, two large bore IV cannulas were secured. Uh, uh, blood was taken for uh, baseline investigations, blood grouping and cross matching. One liter of warm crystalloids bolus was given. Police catheter was inserted. 100 ml of urine was seen in the bag. One gram IV tranexamic acid bolus was given. So just go back to the first slides, uh, Dr. Sejos. Yes, sir. The initial slide. Yeah, okay. So, Dr. Moses, are any questions you yeah. would like? Okay. Yeah, just uh, Dr. Sis, I just wanted to know how did you check the patency of the airway when the patient had come to the so, uh, emergency? How uh, will you check? Once the patient is inside, you can ask her uh, her name, what happened. If she's able to speak back, then that means uh, her airway is patent. Uh, like, uh, or else uh, you can check for uh, uh, any pooling of secretions or any foreign body. Uh, and you can give a suction. And if possible, if she's not uh, maintaining, then you can, uh, if she, her GCS allows, then we can put our pharyngeal airway. But we, first thing you can is just ask her her name. If she's able to respond, that well enough says that her airway is patent. Okay. Dr. Sisjos, uh, looking at the vitals, which system is involved here has been affected? Sir, uh, 
sir uh, if you look into her uh, uh, respiratory system definitely she is not able to maintain saturation her bp is on a lower side her pulse rate is on a higher side so circulation is also affected and gcs is uh, okay 14 out of 15 so, so mainly if the blood pressure is not good what does that mean uh, circulation sir so, so what does that imply Ca what the, cardiac cardiac circulation so what, what that is all right but why is the blood pressure going low uh, it may, in trauma patients, most common cause is mostly it is uh, hemorrhage, sir. So it looks like somewhere she's bleeding. Is, are there other causes of low blood pressure in a trauma patient? Yes, sir. Non hemorrhagic causes are there actually. Uh, pneumothorax can be a um, uh, cardiac tamponade, pneumothorax, um, attention pneumothorax, I mean. Um, then um, neurogenic shock can be there, cardiogenic shock. Okay, very good. And why do you think she is becoming drowsy? Uh, it's because of uh, falling BP, sir. Falling BP further will. Uh... And, maybe... and in her case, uh, uh... yes, sir. Yeah. Any other cause for drowsiness? Uh, reduced perfusion, sir, and uh, uh, hypoxemia also. Yeah, hypoxemia. She is maintaining saturation. Any other cause? She maybe she has intracranial bleed also, no? Or some uh, yes, sir. Uh. Cannot rule out, huh? Yes. Carry on. So, um, moving on. Here, no, no, just hold the slide here. Just go back. Yes, so now she has uh, bilateral uh, distended neck veins. What is the cause? Likely cause? A likely cause is pneumothorax, sir, or what? hemothorax, or no, no, pneumothorax. It can or... be. Huh? It, Hem... it can. Uh, sorry, sir. It can be. Um. Um, cardiac tamponade can also cause distended neck veins. So one is cardiac tamponade, second is pneumothorax, more specifically tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. Yes. The simple pneumothorax is not caused. Okay. Then she has bilateral decreased air entry. So obviously both these lungs are affected and <clears throat> you are given one crystalloid of uh, fluid. Is there any... One liter warm crystalloid, sir. Warm. Yes, yes, sir. What is the required temperature? Optimal temperature? Of the warm fluid? Um, is there a temperature? Or, I mean, or like warm temperature is all right, but is there any temperature, particular temperature, approximately? And uh, what is the choice of the crystalloid will give in this kind of patients? Balanced salt solutions. Why not normal saline or ringal active? It will cause uh, hyperchloremia if you're. If you are giving NS and all, too much of NS will. And uh, you said uh, given one gram of tranexamic acid. Any evidence for this? For giving tranexamic acid? Uh, yes, sir. Um, at the trial, sir. Uh, the what is wrong? What is the trial? Um, crash two trial. Ah, uh, crash two trial. Crash two trial, sir. Mm, what did it show? Uh, that um, one gram bolus ten uh, at, within ten uh, within within three hours of the patient three hours of the incident yeah yes sir accident mm -hmm. and uh, one gram and the next one gram over eight hours has uh, reduced the uh, exangulation rate showed reduced mortality yes sir okay. so uh, this is just uh, the fluid that has to be given has to be warm to at least around body temperature huh? that much temperature has yes, to be there. And uh, you said balanced fluids. Is there any evidence to say that balanced fluids are better in these patients, trauma patients? Or you can give any kind of fluids? Any kind of crystalloids? Uh, no, sir. Balanced is better. Balanced all solutions. It's not like that uh, in this in these patients, uh, Dr. Sisjos. What happens is uh, balanced fluids are even in any patients, in non-trauma patients are preferred if you are going to give large volume resuscitation. At the outset, they are more costly. And small amount of fluids do not make any difference to the chloride balance or whatever benefits you get from uh, <clears throat> these kind of balanced fluids. And uh, you don't, uh, you're not supposed to give a lot of fluids in these patients anyway, trauma patients. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there is no evidence to suggest anything. Normal saline or ringal lactate is good enough. So balance okay. is not the way to go in these trauma patients. There is no evidence to suggest any kind of fluid in this. Normal saline, ringal lactate is good enough. And uh, you know of any trials uh, after crash two? 
for uh, trauma patients supporting tranexamic acid and there's a very recent trial also? Um, no, sir. Only crash through. Dr. Joseph, any trials after crash through? Well, there was the patch trial, which is the most recent one. Yes, um, can, you, can you tell a little so, about it? So the patch trial, uh, uh, there they uh, found that uh, in the secondary outcomes, uh, tranexamic acid compared to the placebo uh, at uh, 24 hours, uh, there was uh, lower mortality. Uh, however, at six months, there was no significant difference between so uh, there the placebo and tranexamic acid. trial, uh, very rightly said, uh, the crash 3 trial was in head injury patients. And yes. after that, there is a patch trial very yeah. recently, just a couple of months ago. In these patients, in, in this trial, actually, the patient was sh shifted to, you know, ICUs, which uh, were equipped particularly to deal with trauma patients. That was the difference. And again, this was supportive of uh, tranexamic acid. So, Sishos, what is tranexamic acid? What is the mechanism of action? Uh, it, uh, streng uh, it prevents uh, clot lysis, sir. It prevents? By uh, clot lysis by uh, it is anti fibrinolytic, anti fibrinolytic, yeah, okay. yes, sir. Okay, so any recent uh, trends towards the use of tranexamic acid, Dr. Joseph? Any 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 new developments? Well, uh, according to the latest KTLS guidelines, uh, there is no change uh, within three hours. Uh, tranexamic acid is advised. Uh, the first dose should be given over 10 minutes, and uh, the next dose should be given. Uh, over eight hours. Uh, that guideline has not changed. Um, but of course, these, this is based on the 10th edition of the ATLS uh, guidelines, which have not been updated since 2018. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you. But you know, going beyond the ATLS guidelines, because guidelines, I think, were has been three, four years, they have not been updated. Yes. Now, TEG yes. is coming up in a big way. Huh? Yes. So you can use TEG. If TEG is not showing a hyperfibrinolytic uh, state, you can probably do away with the tranexamic acid. That is the newer concept. Because if there is no hyperfibrinolysis, there is no point in giving uh, an antifibrinolytic agent. That is a newer concept using TEG. Uh, so if the ICU is using TEG, probably you can use TEG. Uh, and that is what the European Society guidelines in trauma published very recently say that TEG uh, all, can be used in these patients of trauma to guide your, you know, uh, tranexamic acid and blood products use, etc. Okay. So, so, uh, so since after giving the crystal arts, Still, the patient is hypertensive. So, what will you do next? Uh, so, uh, next is like uh, we can't give so many fluids. Patient is uh, is not responding to the fluid re resuscitation, right? So, uh, we can start actually blood transfusion because uh, in view of uh, damage control resuscitation, patient might be the one thing is patient might even if patient is not responding that means uh, patient is bleeding somewhere so we have to find the source of bleeding and we have to rule out non hemorrhagic causes of uh, shock also okay still the patient is hypertensive will you do something your strategy will you activate something uh, mtp sir massive so what is uh, massive transmission protocol yeah, uh, sir. Uh, so, uh, massive transmission protocol is uh, uh, activated if a patient is uh, 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 losing blood more than fifty percent of his blood volume. We have to replace that much, or a patient requires more than uh, ten PRBCs uh, within uh, twenty four hours, or patient uh, requires more than four, uh, more than ten PRBCs in twenty four hours. Sir. Okay. And is what is the ratio we give the blood and blood products? Any it's ratio? A, fixed ratio, ratio is there? Uh, there is a one is to one is to one ratio, sir. Why we give that ratio? Any evidence for that? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, there are two trials actually. Uh, uh, prompt and prosper trial is there. Proper oh, trial is there. Prompt trial. Prompt trial. It says that that increased plasma or a platelet to uh, PRBC has shown um, uh, this one. Six hour mortality rate is mortality rate is uh, less in those patients who receive one is to one is to one ratio, and in proper they have seen that that exsanguination rate is decreased. In, but even though in the both the trials twenty four hour mortality rate is the same, twenty four hour the and the thirty day mortality is, 30 day is the same. It's yeah. the same, but the exsanguination rate is less 
if we are giving in uh, one is to one is to one ratio of okay so what are the endpoints of transmission in mtp protocol any endpoints yes sir first thing is the signs um, and symptoms of uh, hypertension we have to see into that uh, whether uh, so second thing is uh, urine output urine output is a, a good indicator sensitive indicator of uh, this one but mainly uh, if resuscitation uh, if with resuscitation if uh, bp is not picking futile or if when we look into while ongoing resuscitation if if you see that hb is 10 or if you see platelet count is almost uh, uh, 1, 1 1.5 lakh uh, uh, so in that cases actually we can stop mtp okay any so this, okay carry on so it basically clinically we have to see the patient sir so any scores are there to predict uh, the need for uh, mtp any scores you know of um Ah, scores is sir. Uh, TASH score is there. What is the TASH? Uh, that is uh, trauma, trauma associated. Trauma associated. Yes, sir. Uh, so, yeah, uh, in that, we look into uh, whether there's a fracture of extremity, pelvis. We look into BP. We look into uh, heart rate, gender, hemoglobin. Uh, then, um, yes, fast. If fast is, fast is positive. So, uh, if it is the score is more than 16, then there is a 50 percent um uh, more than 50 percent chance of you know giving um, activating mtp then uh, then one more is there abc assessment of blood consumption uh, assess assessment of blood uh, uh, yeah yes sir consumption in that also we look into uh, whether there is um, we look into bp uh, heart rate if it is more than 120 bp uh, we look into systolic blood pressure if it is less than 90 then we look into e fast whether EFAST is positive and also uh, um, any fractures. Okay, if, if EFAST is not positive, no. okay. What are the limitations of EFAST? Uh, uh, EFAST is actually um, operator dependent, actually. Uh, one thing is that. Uh, second thing, uh, the um, What can injuries... you miss in EFAST? Sir, pardon, sir. What are the things you can miss in EFAST? Uh, we can miss out on uh, retroperitoneal, uh, this one, hemorrhage. Diaphragm can be missed out. Uh, major vessels are missed out. Only we will be, we'll be, yes, sir? Bowel perforations. Bowel perforations can be missed out. Only thing is we'll be able to find, I mean, whether the free fluid is there in hepatorenal, splenic, okay. splenorenal and uh, pelvic. Should we move forward, sir? Yes, please move. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this is the chest X-ray after right ICD placement. So, what is there in the X-ray, Doctor Justice Jones? Uh, is... uh, it shows a uh, ICD uh, placed into the right hemithorax. Sir. What else is there? Uh, so we can see the. So Dr. Francis, do you like to comment on the X-ray findings? Yes, uh, there seems to be a little bit of cutaneous emphysema as well. Um, um, yes, uh, other than that, yeah, I can see the ICD is uh, inserted, the lungs are well expanded. Um, you cannot so, comment on cardiomegaly because of the AP view. Um, suppose the, uh, mediastinum. Yeah, please carry on. Yeah. Mediastinum, there is a bit of tracheal deviation towards the right side. Um, yeah, so when you look at an ICU x ray, it's very important to look at rotation. Uh, that's very important because most of the ICU x rays are rotated. And the rotation, I'm sure you know how to make out all the, everybody. And uh, the slight rotation is there in the x ray. But uh, very important to note is that uh, the diaphragm is elevated. The right diaphragm is elevated. Uh, that, that's uh, compared to the left. And the left base is hazy. Important to note that the left base is not clear. The left base is all hazy. You can't see the diaphragm clearly. So these two findings uh, stand out. And even the left cardiac border is not clear. The left bo cardiac border is not clear. So these are the findings in the X-ray as such. Uh, okay, Dr. Sisjos, move on. 
this is her ABG, wherein her pH is 7.30, PCO2 is 46, PO2 is uh, 72, uh, her HB is uh, 6.5, uh, saturation 92, and her lactates are 1 and... Uh, so, it, base. Uh, your, yes, sir. There are a lot of question marks. What does this mean in the X-ray, in the ABG? Can you see? B before each value, there are a lot yes. of question marks. What does that mean? Um, so, you see, this kind of a ABG is common uh, when the machine is not calibrated properly. Properly. Mm. It's very common in our issues. So, for everybody, if you get these values, please uh, make sure that the ABG values are correct because this raises a doubt on the quality of the ABG at that time because machines sometimes don't get calibrated frequently enough. Or for some other reason, the values may not be correct. That is the meaning of these question marks. Huh? So that is the one thing I wanted to point out about such ABGs. These are very common in the ICUs. We get these question marks with ABGs. And uh, that, that is the meaning of these question marks. Now, this is showing respiratory acidosis. Anything more you want to say about the ABG diagnosis, just uh, apart from respiratory acidosis? HB is 6.5, sir. Uh, by Kavasmin. So, so uh, just to... Uh, qualified further, this is uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you, it should be exact no. for ABG diagnosis. Uncompensated, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, carry on. So even after ICD placement, again, uh, the uh, the it is it was seen that the patient's uh, respiratory rate increased to forty per minute. BP was not responding to fluid resuscitation. Her GCS had dropped to uh, drop uh, drop from E four B four M six to E two V three M five. Uh, ABG showed a hypoxemia. So, uh, uh, in this scenario, the patient uh, had to be intubated due to worsening shock and respiratory distress uh, while uh, while giving manual inline stabilization. RT was inserted orally and C collar was applied again. So, this is the uh, so ma man manual inline stabilization of cervical splint, uh, wherein uh, the there is a um, the provider will stand at the head and or side and using his uh, palm and fingers, uh, uh, the provider will um, stabilize the occiput mastoid so that uh, the cervical spine is uh, immobilized for any airway uh, intervention. So. so now after intubation, uh, the saturation improved to 96% on FiO2 of 60 with a peep of 5 cm water. And then blood transfusion was started. Uh, BP improved to 110 80. Uh, urine output improved to 75 ml per hour. Uh, and on exposure, on uh, QK exposure, we saw that a pa patient had a deformity on the right lower limb. Uh, X-ray was taken, uh, but there was no external hemorrhage. And the X-ray showed a uh, comminated fracture of the distal end of right femur. So we've gone through the uh, primary survey, sir. The ABCD is now uh, on Thomas plane was placed and the fracture was uh, reduced with traction. ECG was taken. The adjuncts of uh, primary survey that is ECG and ABG was repeated. ABG which repeated showed again 7.3, PCO2 of 50, PO2 of 128 and um, lactates have come down to 0.8. That's it, sir. HB was 8.1 gram per deciliter. And then uh, E first was done. Can I go back? Yes, sir. So why the PCO2 is high? Uh, uh, maybe the patient is hypoventilated, sir. She's patient is intubated. Patient is intubated. Maybe, uh, so uh, uh, maybe the rate... Uh, there was uh, carbon dioxide retention maybe because of lung conditions or... And but she had pneumothorax. We have not done CT chest yet, right? Ah, yes, sir. Okay, so there is a pneumothorax you have put in a drain. And yes, sir. Pneumothorax. Air entry was also decreased. And left side x is not normal, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Left side, there is x in us. Uh, we do not know what is happening on the legs, uh, left side. We do not know what is happening uh, to the parenchyma in all probability. There may be fractures also. Huh? Yes, sir. And how was the ventilation? What 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 kind of minute ventilation and all was going on? Was it synchronous? Was she sedated? Uh, she was sedated, paralyzed, sir. Okay. Or, uh, were you giving enough minute ventilation? 
yes uh, oh yeah maybe it was maybe during the shift it was not okay so difficult to say so probably she had a pneumothorax and uh, is probably not how many hours after putting the test tube has this abg been done uh, uh actually after putting icd we had to intubate her i mean she she there was worsening of the shock and also uh, um, she had become more tachypneic so this is just after I think intubation, sir. I mean, we uh, yes, okay. sir. Which is just after intubation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so how uh, much time of ICD? ICD would have been placed some fifteen to twenty minutes before. Okay, okay. So this just minutes before maybe. Yeah. So so there has to be time, you know, for the pneumonia. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's why, sir. Yeah. And she's going into hypotension. Does hypotension uh, cause uh, increased PCO two? Does it have any bearing on PCO two? Yes, sir, it can. Hypotension can precipitate PCO2 elevation. PCO2. Huh? Because gas exchange gets eliminated, there's ventilation yeah, yes, sir. impairment. So everything is happening. You just put the ICD and you have intubated her. She was going into hypotension. So all this is leading to elevated PCO2. And there may be more lung pathology also than we suspect. Huh? Yes, sir. Because uh, <clears throat> PCO2 elevation is not that common in a pneumothorax when you, once you put the ICD. Okay, fair enough. Then what, what about the base excess? And the so there is a base excess of minus one point uh, minus one point eight, huh? Yes, sir. And lactate is normal. Yes, sir. The, uh, this is post uh, one liter fluid resuscitation so and there, also. Why is there a base excess if the lactate is normal? Mm. What does the base excess mean, Dr. Sisjos? Uh, minus 1.8 base deficit sir. Um, so what does that mean uh, that means um, the anion gap sir yeah so there is some degree of acidosis going on huh? there is a base deficit huh? yes sir so lactate is normal so what can what else can cause in this situation? Lactate is not causing it. Yes, sir. Um, in this case, anything to anything else to do with perfusion? So mm -hmm. renal perfusion gets impaired. Huh? If there is hypotension, you get renal perfusion impairment like a pre-renal AKI. Okay, sir. So that leads to acidosis. Huh? So probably kidney is getting affected a little. Okay, carry on. Uh, but uh, but she had you no. eh, okay, sir. Uh, then uh, e fast was done, which showed a free fluid in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. Okay. So e fast that. Uh, so extended fast, wherein uh, we see uh, it is a adjunct in primary survey, uh, wherein uh, hepatorenal recess, perisplenic area, subsifoid pericardial window, suprabibic yeah. window, and bilateral thoracic windows are seen for any flu free fluid uh, accumulation, sir. So it in a way, it will be able to have a rough idea on internal hemorrhage, sir, in case of a trauma patient. Next, on to secondary survey. Uh, that is the history is elicited. Uh, so patient had no allergies, no comorbidities. She was not on any medication. Last meal was taken four hours back. And on uh, moving on to head to toe examination, there was no obvious lacerations or swelling of the scalp. Uh, uh, there was no, uh, her uh, pupils were bilaterally, uh, bilateral pupils were e equally reactive. Uh, there was no raccoon eye, no um, contusions or anything. Uh, on examination, uh, on evaluation, again, uh, we saw that the tube is in place, bilateral air entry is equal, C-spine is protected with C-collar, and um, uh, right ICD collar movement is present, no obvious conditions or lacerations on the chest. Moving on to abdomen, uh, uh, there is a condition present on the, life, uh, uh, on the left side, then perineum, vagina, and rectum examination was also done, uh, which was which found out to be normal. Then uh, moving on to extremities, uh, right femur thomas splint was uh, applied, was there, and distal pulses were well felt. 
and uh, neurological status uh, it could not be uh, assessed because the patient was sedated paralyzed for mechanical ventilation uh, and uh, also um, cct pct could not be assessed because of same reason she was sedated paralyzed and log log, log roll was done uh, and uh, log roll was also ne uh, negative so how do you do the log roll so in log roll uh, so um, so we need, uh, in case of uh, trauma patients, uh, four people uh, are uh, requ um, required to do the log, log roll. That is two people, two person will be standing on the side of the patient. One, uh, one, uh, one doctor will be standing on the head and side. Uh, he will be stabilizing the um, spine and the head. And the uh, uh, two people, they will move the uh, patient's uh, body and extremity to one side. And the one on the doctor on the head and side will uh, make sure that the spine, uh, C spine and head is in alignment with the whole body. Meanwhile, the fourth doctor will uh, examine. Um, uh, fourth doctor will remove the spine board and will uh, or uh, she can she or he can examine the um, back for any um, lacerations, conditions, any deformity. So. And once the uh, yeah once the board is removed, the, then the three people can return the patient to the supine position uh, while maintaining the alignment of the spine. Okay. Next slide. So, so, yeah. so log roll was negative in this patient. So any clinical uh, screening decision tools you do while you are intubating this patient, C spine especially. Ah uh, yes sir, uh, that is. Uh, uh, in suspicion of if there is a suspicion of c-spine injury uh we have to go ahead with the uh, we have two criteria that is one is nexus criteria and one is canadian c-spine rule so in uh nexus criteria that is uh, national emergency x-ray utilization study we have to see whether all this uh, uh, patient meets all this low risk criteria we have to see uh, whether patient has got any posterior midline cervical spine tenderness or any evidence of intoxication, especially alcohol and all, and uh, GCX alertness, then any focal neurological deficit and also any um, any distracting injuries. If it is, if all this is there, then we have to go ahead with radiography. If it is not there, then it's okay. I mean, then, then we have Canadian C-spine rule, wherein uh, in case of alert patients, uh, stable trauma patients in whom uh, cervical spine injury is a concern. So very high risk factor is one is a geriatric patient. Uh, there is uh, age more than 65 years. Then if um, dangerous mechanism of uh, accident is involved, like for example, uh, fall from height or any axial load over on the head. Then um, parasthesias in extremities. If all if all this any of this criteria is there, then we have to go ahead with the uh, radiography. Or if it is not there, then again we have some lower risk factors we have to see into that, like um, that allows safe range of mo motion assessment. So we can do like in case of if patient sitting position in ED, uh, we can do uh, ambulate if the patient was ambulatory at any time delayed onset of neck pain or no midline cervical tenderness. So, and if all this is there, we can ask the patient to able, uh, whether he's able to rotate his neck actively 45 degree to left, left and right. If S means, then there is no requirement of radiography. But in any of this, there is no, then we have to go ahead with the radiography. Okay, move on. So, um, secondary survey that is head to toe evaluation, ample history. Uh, that is allergies, medications, past illness, pregnancy, last meal, last meal, events or environment leading to the incident. So all this is elicited in the secondary survey history. So, so did, you, and, did you get anything in the past history? And, no, sir. Actually, she uh, there was she she did not have any comorbidities, or uh, she was not on any medications. She had no allergies. Last meal was taken for uh, four hours back. Okay. Okay, then uh, secondary survey evaluation also in, uh, involves a head-to-toe examination where head, uh, we look for any lacerations, conditions, uh, raccoon eyes, eyes, orbital, any uh, features suggestive of uh, orbital fracture. Then any maxillofacial structure, uh, uh, fa fractures involving maxillofacial structures we have to see because this will, um, in the future, it will it will make intubation difficult, airway. Um, so, so the patency, of airway will be uh, 
uh, looked into by looking into maxillo facial structures then c spine should be uh, evaluated uh, that is uh, also the neck for any distended vein uh, whether the um, whether there is any uh, deviation of trachea and uh, chest for uh, chest should be um, palpation a percussion auscultation uh, then whether there is any visible uh, penetra penetrating injuries then um, uh, abdomen abdomen uh, again for we have to look into any conditions pelvis uh, perineum rectum vagina should also be uh, evaluated uh, for any uh, hemorrhage or bleeding from urethral orifice or from per rectal bleeding then musculoskeletal that is the extremities should also be that is upper extremities lower extremities should be evaluated for any deformity any tenderness any um, hemorrhage um, then um, then neurological system a neurological assessment uh, will involve the gcs then uh, pupils then any focal neurological deficits so secondary surveys uh, secondary survey covers uh, head to toe and their evaluation so and then uh, this will be aided with the secondary adjuncts. So uh, for this patient, we had done CT brain. Uh, it was normal. And CT thorax showed bilateral uh, pleural effusion with collapse consolidation of underlying lungs and left 12th rib posterior fracture. And right ICD was, see, uh, was seen in situ. So then CT also... Just, just go back uh, there. You know? Now we come to the CT chest. So you had noted bilateral decreased your entry, right? Yes, sir. The right side air entry was decreased because of pneumothorax, right? And uh, why was the left side air entry decreased then? Not it says, Joe, now you have the CT thorax with you. Uh, yes, sir. With the maybe the um, left 12th rib posterior fracture. So, how does that lead to decreased air entry? Uh, it can. Maybe there is some minimal uh, pneumothorax, sir. Or. Uh, um, and it can this left to twelfth rib posterior fracture can a fracture can also cause uh, um, lung conditions. Uh, there might be lung conditions. Uh, there is also you have the CT thorax in front of you now. So there is no condition. Where's the condition? Um, collapse consolidation of underlying lungs. So what, collapse consolidation and you have a bilateral effusion. So collapse consolidation means the collapse consolidation is because of the effusion. So you have an effusion on the left side. Uh, with the underlying collapse cons consolidation. Whenever collapse consolidation is there, that means it's generally because of an effusion. And you have a bilateral, and you have a left 12th rib posterior fracture. So yes, you said it can be because of left rib fracture. So how does the left rib fracture lead to decrease your entry? No, uh, on left side, right side, right so side, right. right side is okay. There was a big pneumothorax. Left yes, sir. I have said correctly that there's a 12th rib posterior fracture, but how does a rib fracture lead to decrease your entry? So you see, there's a lot of pain associated with rib fracture. Rib fractures are very painful. Ah, uh, yes, sir. So because of, yeah, yeah. pain as huh? patient might. Yeah, lung expansion goes down. Okay. Uh, and now we have a bilateral effusion. On the right side, you said that she had drained blood. Now we do not know what is this effusion on the left side. And, uh, so we need to see whether this is a hemothorax or what, and why is this occurring? Uh, so there's a traumatic hemothorax or what? Okay, carry on. CT whole spine was done, uh, which showed C4 teardrop fracture, D12 compression fracture, uh, L1, L2 transverse process fracture, L3, L4 anterior wedge compression fracture. Uh, these are the images showing. You see, if you go back now, if you go back here. Even there's a there's a cervical uh, spine involvement and there's a thorax involvement. All this can also impair movement and cause pain in the thorax. Huh? This also leads to pain in the thorax and decreased uh, movements of the thorax. Next. Uh, these are the CT images showing a teardrop a fracture of C4 and uh, uh, the D12 compression fracture and uh, L3, L4 anterior wedge compression fracture. CCT abdomen was done. Uh, uh, it was showing grade 3 splenic laceration with hemoperitoneum. And then later on, uh, all the consultations were taken. That is, uh, the cardiothoracic uh, surgeon was involved. He was he had ad advised for, to continue ICD on bottle and lower section to repeat uh, X-rays on a daily basis. Orthopedician was involved. Uh, the plan was to... Um, 
plan was for a definitive surgery on a later date once the patient is stabilized and uh, TK brace was uh, advised for um, the uh, lumbar fracture uh, and a general surgeon was involved. He uh, From his side, it was needle active intervention, HBPCV, 6 hour monitoring, strict abdominal girth monitoring. So, so this is after how much time of uh, pneumothorax of the ICD? Uh, so this uh, is all in uh, EMET, sir. No, you have put the suction in the beginning itself or later on? No, sir. Uh, actually, on uh, usually on that back, actually, sir. Uh, this is like uh, once they have, uh, after CTVS had uh, seen, they had asked to put the ICD on bottle and lower suction. In the beginning itself? No, no, sir. Not in the beginning. Okay. So It is after CTVS consultation, sir. Okay. So, Dr. Francis Joseph, sir, so what what are what are your views on applying suction in a pneumothorax patient and when it should be applied and does it really help? So your views on suction. So in this case, uh, because there was already lung expansion, uh, it may not have been required. Uh, however, if there was a hemoneumothorax and there was continuous drainage um, uh, and repeated X-rays were done, which were showing collection, then perhaps. Uh, patient would have benefited from low suction. Basically, inadequate uh, expansion of the lung. So, so should you apply it in the beginning itself or after how much time? How much time do you allow for the lung to expand on its own? So, uh, generally, we, uh, uh, when the patient is received from emergency medicine, we keep the patient on uh, on bag uh, and then we repeat an x-ray after 12 hours. Uh, and uh, if there is no expansion, then uh, we put the patient on the suction. Are there any downsides to applying suction? Yes. Uh, 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 if uh, there can be uh, excess amount of suction uh, that you can apply, uh, that can also cause excess amount of uh, third phase fluid loss. Uh, then, um, yes, uh, so it, it can be an uncontrolled sort of uh, suction. And if it goes unattended, then uh, it, it can also hamper. Uh, and, and how much suction do you apply normally? Uh, um, minus 50 to minus 80 centimeters of water is what we Sorry? generally use. Minus 50 to minus 80 centimeters of water is what we generally use. Okay. So, you see, suction uh, has uh, uh, somewhat of a controversy in the sense people say that if you apply suction, you'll be uh, continuously uh, you know, causing a negative pressure suction and it may not allow the pneumothorax to heal. But by and large, suction can be applied. That is the consensus. And uh, 48 hours is the time uh, allowed for a pneumothorax to heal on its own. Most pneumothoraces will heal on, uh, on their own within 48 hours. However, if at 48 hours or beyond, if the if pneumothorax is not healed, you can apply a uh, suction. And uh, suction uh, varies anywhere from minus 5 to minus 20 starting at uh, minus 5. And uh, minus 20 is extremely high, but um, starting at minus 5, you can apply suction. And uh, you should be very carefully controlled because it can lead to formation of bronchopleural fistula also at times. So one has to be very careful with suction. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, you have gone in for uh, surgery now, and hemoglobin is being monitored. OK, Dr. Sisjos, carry on. So, working diagnosis in SICUs, uh, uh, case of polytrauma with right uh, pneumohemothorax, status post, uh, right ICD placement, grade 3 splenic laceration, C4 uh, teardrop fracture, D12 compression fracture, L3, L4 compression fracture, left 12th rib fracture, right distal femur fracture. Uh, so, on day 0, uh, when the patient, patient was received in uh, SICU, ABCDs were... Uh, Again, repeated, uh, uh, the ETT was in place, bilateral air entry was equal, uh, C collar was present, uh, right ICD collar movement present, uh, otherwise it was normal vesicular breath sounds. Patient was hemodynamically stable with a BP of 1080, uh, heart rate of 90, uh, then uh, uh, GCS uh, was E4, VT, M6, pupils were bilaterally uh, uh, equally uh, equal and reactive, and then... Um, um, exposure was also done. Uh, that is, patient had a Thomas plane on right lower limb. Traction was uh, present. Peripheral pulses were felt. No external hemorrhage. But a condition uh, on left side of abdomen. Head to toe evaluation was also done. Uh, no other added findings. Patient was continued on mechanical ventilation on minimal 
minimal ventilatory requirements, mild sedation started, chest x ray showed lung expansion on right side. So, in okay. that explanation, uh, what would you particularly look for, Dr. Sejos, in this? Where Pardon, sir? In the examination, something specifically you look for? Now, you're doing a uh, evaluation head to toe? And you have all the findings, the CTs and all in front of you? Uh, in head to toe uh, evaluation, uh, sir, uh, we have C4 uh, teardrop fracture. One is that. Then in the spine, we have a D12 uh, uh, fracture. So, 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 absolutely. So, what would you be concerned about here? So, that's why uh, during head, head to toe evaluation, uh, uh, we'll be concerned about the um, mobilization of the patient. Like, uh, so, for any evaluation, we'll be doing log roll only if we have to see the backside. That is all right. But what kind of a deficit would you be looking for? See, considering the fact that the spine has multiple fractures. Uh, sir, uh, um, patient um, patient might be having uh, paraparesis. Para yes, very important. You yes, have to sir. Look for paraparesis here. You know, yes, because sir. you cannot miss out findings. You see, yes, the, all right, and the family patient is all right. And then he, at the end of the day, you realize that he can't walk. You tell the family. It uh, cuts a very sorry figure. Huh? Yes. Uh, yeah. There were no focal neurological deficits, sir. Uh, very important. Movements of the toes, the foot, etc. should be done properly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no focal neurological deficits. And she was continued on mechanical ventilation. Uh, minimum, uh, mild sedation started. Then uh, routine blood investigations were uh, sent. Uh, lung ultrasound screening echo were done. Invasive lines were placed. Uh, empirical antibiotics and other supportive measures were started. Then on uh, her... Um, this just is her... Back, uh, just go back here. No? So, uh, so, Dr. Joseph, sir, uh, the use of antibiotics here. Any comments? Patient does not have any open wounds as far as I can make out. Do you, do you think it is it a policy or do you, should we give or not give in surgical trauma patients? Uh, so uh, if there is a uh, history of penetrating trauma um, uh, or depending on the environment in which uh, the accident happened, then yes, there would be an indication to start uh, uh, antibiotics. Um, but otherwise, uh, if there's an absence of penetrating trauma, uh, we would wait. So, so what about the hemothorax here? Is that an indication to give antibiotics? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, you have placed an ICD in a hemothorax. So, so why have we started empirical antibiotics? Uh, sir, ICD we have placed. Yeah, so it is a plus minus situation. ICD with the hemothorax for a short duration, maybe you can give. Okay, because hemothorax, you know, collections of blood are potent uh, blood cultures, in a way, to say. And staph is a very common organism in blood cultures, in uh, blood collections. And, uh, you know, for ICD, uh, in, in a patient with a hemonemothorax, you may give for 24 to 48 hours, but uh, there's no strict indication to give antibiotics even in these patients. So, medical antibiotics, you know, that may be started as a policy of the ICU, but uh, one does not uh, need antibiotics uh, without open uh, injuries as such, uh, or any inf obvious infection. Okay, next. Uh, these are our baseline investigations, sir. HB of 8.1, uh, total counts were a little elevated, 17.4. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, AST, ALT, AST is 231, ALT 148. Other blood uh, invest parameters like uh, CREAT, uh, Blood urea uh, electrolytes are within normal range. Then on the day one, uh, we go found out that. Just go back. Why the TNC increase? Is there an infection? Uh, it can be trauma induced, sir. Okay. Like. Okay, okay. Uh, Fine. Why is sorry. the PT increase? STOLD? Uh, there might be some uh, sh uh, because of shock, sir, maybe. Okay. And shock. any blood urea creatinine? Blood urea creatinine is uh, normal, sir, actually. Uh, uh, I think we started fluid resuscitation right in time. No, but is there anything beyond that? If they are in normal limits. Is there anything else? Blood urea is upper limit of normal, I think. Okay. Huh? Well, how much yeah, is yes. still, uh, uh, in your this thing? Any, you remember? Uh, till, uh, I uh, think this range only, sir, uh, 45, 50. 35. Yes, a little elevated. 
Uh, urea 44 is a little elevated. Anyway, so this is, you know, there's something known as the blood urea creatinine ratio. Okay, if the urea is slightly high or more than even slightly high, you do a blood urea to a creatinine ratio. And if that's more than 40, that means impaired renal perfusion and the need for volume replacement. Huh? So that's a very important indicator and a very simple indicator of volume requirement in a patient who is supposed to be hypovolemic in any way. A blood urea to creatinine ratio of more than 40. Uh, and I think this blood urea is slightly high. Normally it's 40 or depends from lab to lab, but might be slightly high. Okay, carry on. Um. So on uh, day one, uh, on uh, auscultation, we found out that the decreased uh, breath sounds were on the left side. Uh, Cute lung ultrasound was done. It showed uh, there was no sliding sign and M M mode showed barcode sign. Emergency chest X-ray was taken. Uh, she had developed a pneumothorax left side. Left ICD was placed. Uh, and uh, uh, ortho general surgery had reviewed the patient. There was a plan for MRI whole spine in view of uh, um, D, uh, the CT spine whole spine showing D12 fracture and uh, L3, L4 anterior wedge compression fracture. So the MRI whole spine, it showed a degenerative disco, uh, vertebral disease of lumbar spine. Vertebral body fractures of D12, L3, L4, uh, same uh, as uh, the CT, uh, but uh, minimal cord indentation at D12 vertebral level. Now on day two, uh, just go back. Just go back. So why was there a pneumon now on the left side? Uh, sir, uh, there was a left rib actually posterior fracture. Uh, posteriorly had uh, there was a fracture. Uh, it may be because of uh, any minimal pneumo. Maybe it was a simple pneumo and. Uh, Post mechanical ventilation, she de developed. No, you have done a CT a couple of just initially. There was no nothing on the left side. I mean, there was no pneumo as such. Okay, so you see what have probably see, happened was uh, there might have been a small tear in the pleura which was missed or you know which was not there was no neural pneumo. And once you give ventilation, it worsens. Uh, yeah, what is called a small pneumo. And when you give positive pressure ventilation, you get a flooded pneumo. So that is probably what has happened. Uh, yes. There might have been a very small kind of an injury or a very small pneumo which was not picked up on the CT. And once you give positive pressure ventilation, it developed a, a full pneumo. Uh, that is one of the side effects of positive pressure ventilation. Okay. Next. Uh, this is the MRI whole spine showing D12 fracture, mild indentation at D12 vertebral level. Day two. Uh, uh, there was a drop in her HB uh, to 7.6, but there was no increase in abdominal girth. Patient was trans, uh, transfused 1 PRBC, HB improved to 8.4. And uh, ortho had seen the patient, and uh, since the patient was uh, otherwise hemodynamically stable, there was a plan for uh, the ortho, uh, there was a plan from ortho side to do right femur CRIF plus retrograde nailing, uh, plus uh, medial malleolar repair also, also was done, uh, was also planned. After uh, so this was. Uh, after adequate optimization and uh, clearance from CTVS and general surgery, patient was posted for elective ortho procedure on day three. So in day three, uh, patient uh, was <coughs> low growth. In spine board patient was uh, with the C-collar patient was shifted to OT. She uh, underwent right femur CRIF plus retrograde nailing with a medial malleolar repair also. Uh, the procedure went on for three hours, uh, which is done under GA. Indrop was uneventful, hemodynamically stable. Received almost, patient received 2.5 liter crystalloids, adequate urine output. Blood loss around 350 to 400 ml. Uh, and post-operative investigations were within normal limits. This is our X-ray showing uh, the post right femur retrograde nailing and uh, CRIF. Okay, carry on. Post-operative blood investigations, uh, HB was 9.2. Total count was 14. Uh, These are normal, normal values. Yeah. Uh, day 4, post-operative day one, uh, 0. Uh, patient was uh, assessed for readiness uh, of uh, weaning, sir. Weaning trial after so stopping sedation. Weaning trial was given. She was extubated later on the same day. Uh, CTVS ortho general surgery reviews were taken. Patient was so slowly started on enteral nutrition. Other medications and supportive measures were continued. Uh, day 5, post-operative day 1. Uh, she again had a HB drop of 6.9. Two PRBC transmission was uh, given. 
her ultrasound abdomen was done but there was no free fluid uh, in the abdomen repeat x rays were done which was followed by, uh, by cts icd drains were carefully monitored general surgery opinion was again uh, taken in view of a drop in hp from their side also there was nil uh, uh, nil active intervention conservative management ortho had followed up the patient then uh, uh, regarding the course of her ICU stay, uh, she was uh, hemodynamically stable throughout the rest of her ICU stay. ICD drains were monitored on a daily basis. Clamping trial of both the ICDs, one after the other, was done, and their subsequent re removal was also done. Uh, so, uh, in thought, in uh, in a, for the OU, uh, nil active intervention from general surgery and CTVS side. Ortho uh, had operated, uh, had reviewed her on a daily basis. And um, patient was vitally stable. She was shifted out to ortho ITU uh, with full score GCS, no neurological deficits, uh, maintaining saturation on nasal prongs, and was she was clinically stable. So, so antibiotics were hyped for culture because of what reason? Area was she having an infection? Um, sir. Um, I mean, do you, do you, she had a she had a one she had a fever episode. She had one fever. A uh, few uh, episode. Uh, so she was on ceftriaxone. We had hiked up to uh, Piptas. So, so what are the uh, non-infectious causes of fever in the ICU in such a patient? What are the other causes? If does fever always mean any mean infection? Uh, no, sir. Uh, no, no. Uh, it can be um, endocrine causes can be there. Uh, so there what it can is, be. What is the likely cause of fever in such a patient here? Is it likely to be infection or something else? Reactionary, sir. Reactionary to what? To uh, the inflammation and uh, cytokine storm because of the trauma. I mean, uh, she has got multiple systems are involved. Like she has got so many fractures. That did not come. Something more relevant. What are the two possible causes of fever here? One is yes. surgery, right? She just been sir? surgery. Post surgery, okay. For okay. Second is more likely blood transfusion. Multiple transfusions are going on. Ah, uh, yeah, um, blood transfusion reactions are going on. So obviously she'll get fever, huh? Pardon, sir. See, once you get so many transfusions, few some one spike of fever is very likely. Yes, sir. So you know, just uh, take home message. Uh, we have to be very careful with antibiotics. It's very yes, give antibiotics and very difficult to not to give antibiotics, huh? Okay, and what about the culture positivity? What cultures were positive here? Uh, sir, actually, uh, blood culture uh, showed acinato. But but blood she... culture, this is blood culture positive. Uh, yes, sir. But uh, the thing is that only um, she didn't, uh, the counts, uh, clinically she, oh, she no. was stable. This is, this is blood culture showing acetonobacter. Uh, yes, sir. So how do you explain blood culture showing acetonobacter after on the third on the this is an initial sample blood sample? What what, uh, what, day, what day blood culture is this? Because well, she's hardly been there for four days. Uh, um, she was there for almost uh, ten days. Ten days. Yeah. So what, what actually course of uh, I mean. No. Okay. So what on what day was this blood culture sent? Oh, when she had high fever, that's it, sir. Other, but uh, I think it was after seven days or something. So uh, this blood culture was sent on day seven, and it has grown acetonobacter. Is is that right, Doctor Sejus? Ah, uh, yes, sir. So then it's a totally different connotation. No, the way you have written it's very difficult. I thought this is just some urine culture or ET culture which has shown something. You should have written this, you know, blood culture is showing astronobacter. That is very, very significant. That will actually lead to modality also. Because astronobacter is highly resistant and, uh, you know, you are growing blood culture. Blood cultures are again, never taken to be lightly. They are always true, truly positive. And astronobacter is a very difficult bug to clear. So this this is uh, this has come from where I don't know that uh, only the treating team can know. So definitely you have to give proper antibiotics. What antibiotics do you use for astronobacter? So we use here cholestin, sir. Is cholestin enough? Does, does Joseph have any comments on uh, treating astronobacter? 
And where this came from? Because you must have been part of the treating team. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, as far as I remember, uh, um, this patient did not have a blood culture positive. It was a BAL, as far as I remember. Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, it was about a week after the uh, admission. And uh, it uh, it was pan resistant uh, with uh, intermediate sensitivity to cholesterol, so the patient was put on cholesterol. Yeah, so that is more likely because you know, looking at everything, yeah. blood culture showing gastrobacter is not the likely picture here. Bile can always grow because of colonization, and uh, the antibiotics recommended now for gastrobacter, you know, empiric, uh, if you have crab is uh, one cholestin, second is sulbactam, and third is minocycline. And you have to give all three in combination normally because Ashinobacter is high mortality. So you can combine all three, sulbactam, minocycline, and cholestin. And uh, BAL is the likely uh, culture yes, growing positive. That is, otherwise I'm sure you would have written blood culture because blood culture and the patient would have been much more sicker and it's not just a single spike of fever. So here I think it's a contaminant in the BAL. Okay, next. Uh, uh, regarding hemoperitone monitoring, so first one is to identify what is the bleeding source, early involvement of the surgeon, then uh, HBPCV monitoring, abdominal girth monitoring, uh, focus sonography, early urine output monitoring, any clinical signs of impending hemorrhagic shock, contrast imaging to rule out any active extravasation, and if there are any coagulopathies, correction of coagulopathies. So, so you add a splenic trauma. So the spleen was managed conservatively, right? Yes, sir. So, so when when do you remove the spleen? Do you have to remove the spleen in such patient of splenic trauma? Do you have to do a splenectomy? Uh, no, sir. Conservative management is uh, uh, good enough if patient is hemodynamically stable. If the patient is not hemodynamically stable, then? Then uh, you have to do a splenectomy at times. Huh? Yes, sir. The spleen continues to bleed and there is hemodynamic instability, then you have no option. But you generally try to preserve organs like spleen and splenic trauma and liver and liver trauma. So the, you try to preserve them. Eh? Hemodynamic stability is the key. So Dr. Joseph, sir, uh, any 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 other means uh, of conserving the spleen? Any non-operative means of conserving the spleen and treating the splenectomy as the splenic injury? Consider an angiography and an angioembolization. Yes, sir, absolutely. An Absolutely. So angiographic embolization is a organ uh, conserving uh, method in spleen and liver injuries. So Dr. Sis Joseph, before we close up and before Dr. Joseph, Dr. Moses has to answer, ask anything, uh, what are the side effects of splenectomy and what precautions would you like to take before a splenectomy? Uh, so uh, before splenectomy, uh, the thing is that uh, we have to immunize the patient for uh, pneumococcal and uh, meningococcal vaccination should be done actually post splenectomy because okay. patient will be more uh, susceptible for uh, cockle organism infections. Uh, so meningococcal, hemococcal and H flu. So uh, Hemofluenza. Two weeks after splenectomy, you have to give vaccination. What are the complications? These are the long-term ones you have said, infections. The patients are predisposed to infections. What are the immediate uh, complications you see after splenectomy or changes in the patient's lab values? Do you see anything? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hmm. uh, this uh, from uh, this one uh, HB increase in HB uh, because of because uh, I'm not sure, sir. Yeah, so the persistent thrombocytosis and leukocytosis. Thrombocytosis. You see a persistent thrombocytosis and leukocytosis counts go up to 20, 25, 30, 000 for some for a few weeks. Huh? Because spleen is a sequestration organ. And when you remove it, all these counts go up for some time. So, very nice. I hand it over to Dr. Moses Chalajusa, sir, to ask any uh, to summarize. Uh, sis, uh, during uh, when you saw initially this patient was hypovolemic shock, you must have thought. But uh, what are the shock you would have thought of other than hypovolemic shock? Because this patient had a fractured spine. So, what would you have thought of? Uh, one is... Uh... Because of fracture spine, uh, there is a chance for uh, neurogenic shock, sir. So, what's the neuro... difference between uh, neurogenic and spinal? 
So, uh, uh, neurogenic shock uh, is seen in cases of uh, C-spine fractures or upper uh, thoracic vertebra fractures. So, there is loss of uh, sympathetic tone, loss mm -hmm. of uh, uh, vascular tone. So, all this will lead to uh, um, vasodilatation and uh, there will be hypertension. In case of spinal shock, it is like uh, there is a, a flaccidity. So, it is more of... Uh, 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 it is uh, loss of muscular tone actually so it okay. is do you do you give fluids in neurogenic shock uh sir um uh, uh, like you know, sufficient amount of resuscitation will be good but uh, after that uh, vasoconstrictors will be more uh, helpful in case of neurogenic shock okay you have to use the vasopressors vasopressors yes sir. so what is the lethal trade of trauma so these are the questions uh, they ask in the exams. Um, in case of trauma, uh, uh, the lethal triad uh, usually is the hypothermia, one thing. Then patient may go into acidosis and uh, DIC, sir. Coagulopathy. Coagulopathy. Okay. Anything so, else? Dr. Anything? Francis, sir, anything you want to ask or say or comment? Um. Uh, no, I think uh, sir has covered everything. I think this patient had fracture femur, isn't it? Fracture femur, sir, yes. Sir. Yeah. Anything uh, like you will be looking out? Any syndrome, compartment syndrome, anything? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, one thing is, uh, uh, this patient uh, with uh, fracture femur, at a, uh, yeah, at the risk of uh, compartment syndrome. So, uh, in uh, we have to look into uh, the whether there are any signs of compartment syndrome, like. Uh, there will be build up of lactates there will be uh, it, the muscle compartment will be tense tender a patient will be having uh, exaggerated pain on passive movement uh, so in that case uh, we have to it is an emergency in that case patient needs to be operated if the patient is developing um, and if uh, in that case you have to make sure that uh, um, any constrictive uh, dressings are there then we have to remove that uh, any extra pressure on the limb should be removed patient uh, so uh, if if patient develops uh, if there are signs and symptoms of compartment syndrome we have to go ahead with emergency surgery so fasciotomy is the uh, uh, so what are the high risk injuries for uh, compartment syndrome high risk injuries are uh, distracting uh, fractures sir then um, neurovasc uh, neurovascular injury Usually it is tibial and forearm fractures. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah, yes, sir. And some crush injury to the muscle. Crush injuries to the muscle, yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Dr. Tapesh? I think uh, you have uh, covered everything. So just one question, Dr. Sijos, pertaining to the case. Patient was on bilateral ICDs on the ventilator with bilateral pneumothoraces. So yes, when sir. you have such a patient, should you remove the ICD first or should you extubate the patient first and then remove the ICD when the patient is on the ventilator? Uh, uh, we'll extubate the patient first. Sir. Okay, Dr. Sijos, this is an area of uh, gray zone. You can either remove, earlier it was thought that you keep the ICDs because, you know, positive pressure ventilation is a risk factor for creating a pneumothorax, but not anymore. You can extubate the, you can remove the ICDs and keep the patient on the ventilator or vice versa. Huh? So either you can remove the ICDs before extubation or after extubation, either way. So it is not like that anymore. But generally to be safer, yeah. it's better to first to extubate the patient and remove the ICD. Yeah? That's common sense. But as far as whatever trials and whatever evidence is there, you can do either way. Yeah? Okay. Yes. So I think uh, with Dr. Moses' permission, uh, we shall conclude the session. It has been a wonderful presentation, very nice slides and very beautiful case. And I'm sure our audience had uh, good learning and it'll be up on our YouTube channel for all the students to go through. Are there any questions from the audience, please? Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so what is the reason there is a left-sided uh, left uh, uh, fluid in the perisplenic area, not in the splenorenal races? So, so Dr. Moses, sir, you want to answer that? I'm not sure of that. 
So I think that is a surgical question. It's difficult for us to answer that. Yeah. Sir, I, I got the answer because there is a splenorenal ligament that is present between the splenorenal recess that prevents the collection of the fluid. So that is the reason the fluid will be collected in the perisplenic area rather than the splenorenal recess. Okay, it's possible that is the answer, you know, because that is beyond uh, our purview. That is a surgical question. Maybe you are right. So any, any other questions anybody else wants to ask or any comments? Okay, so I think we shall close now. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank the audience. And especially thanks St. John's Medical College, the Bangalore the Surgical ICU, Dr. Charles Moses, sir, and this is sir. And uh, thanks, Dr. Sijos. Very nice presentation, Dr. Sijos. We wish you all the best. And thanks, Dr. Francis Joseph, sir, for your contribution to the teaching. Thank you, Dr. Moses, Charles, this is sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.